by definition, a slave is a person that is disarmed. For too long, African Americans have been on the wrong side of the gun. From the racial motivation of slavery, to the white supremacy movement, to today's escalating black on black crime. The politically correct view that a disarmed black community is a safe community is only safe for those who seek control. The black community went from being disarmed, being mistreated, being enslaved because of a lack of access to guns, ultimately went to a period of saying, aha, we have the right to bear arms, we're going to make sure it's respected, to a period where now the gun is the main tool of maintenance of the narco economy, which is the only economy in the African American community. 400 years of injustice, 400 years of being on the wrong side of the gun. It's time for change. Why is the gangbanger who has the Saturday night special in his pocket given more rights than the average everyday citizen, even though he was illegally armed, he has a right to defend himself and you have not the ability to defend yourself. So if the law says that I can't buy a certain gun, that if I can't carry a gun a certain way, I abide by that because I'm law abiding. But the criminals are the ones that carry, buy any type of guns that they want and are empowered. The basic right of every American is the right to self-defense. Take away that right and the individual is powerless. It's not unusual for America in its long history to disarm or seek to disarm undesirable populations. Gun control laws have kept African Americans in their place for hundreds of years. From the earliest days of slavery up until the mid-1800s, blatantly written gun control laws prohibited slaves and freed slaves from owning firearms. Be it further enacted that if any Negro shall presume to carry arms whatsoever, he shall be whipped with 21 lashes. With the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1866, African Americans were given the right to bear arms, but new laws were written in such a way to exclude blacks from purchasing guns. The greatest service the authorities can render the city now is to disarm every Negro, search every Negro house, and arrest everyone who is... Inexpensive handguns were banned, or high taxes were imposed to keep guns out of the financial reach of a mostly poor black community. There's been various statues throughout every state that had sizable African American populations after slavery to restrict through black codes the ability for blacks to be armed. In 1941, Florida Supreme Court Justice Buford declared the original 1893 Florida Gun Control Act was passed with the purpose of disarming Negro laborers. The statute was never intended to be applied to the white population. In the 1960s, when armed blacks took to the streets in the race riots in Los Angeles, Newark, and Chicago, the laws were once again rewritten. In a futile attempt, to curb the violence, Congress passed the 1968 Gun Control Act. Public outcry for the restrictions of guns after the assassinations of Dr. Martin Luther King and Robert Kennedy hid the true purpose of the legislation. It was Robert Sherrill writing on the 1968 legislation who stated that it was really an attempt to restrict arms for black people. Championed by Senator Thomas Dodd and signed into law by President Johnson, the 68 Gun Control Act 
used shrewdly crafted language to give the authorities control to dictate who could and who could not own a firearm and what types of firearms Americans can own. Thomas Dodd from Connecticut, a Connecticut Yankee, goes to Library of Congress and gets the actual gun act that the Nazis had passed in 1938 and he has it translated into English. The 68 Gun Control Act was written and in some cases almost copied word for word from the same laws the Nazis used in 1938 to control undesirable populations in Hitler's Germany. Both documents categorize and restrict firearms to certain individuals. Both documents are based on racial fear. And so they take this document and they use it to draft legislation to start requiring more licensing and more constriction of the right to keep and bear arms. When I found out what the restrictions were, I was very surprised. Each town, each police chief has the discretion of whether to give a license or not. There is just not one set rule. It seems that a lot of black people, and especially young black men, are held to a higher standard. Maybe you have a, a drunk driving record, and that would be enough to disqualify you. Where legally it's not. It's not a felony conviction. Whereas maybe somebody from the suburbs that's white, and maybe from a more influential family, would have the same exact record as you do, but would not be denied. It's kind of subtle discrimination. It seems unthinkable today that legislation is still being written to keep minorities in their place, but it is. Purchasing a firearm requires the applicant to fill out a federal form to verify their race. Restrictive gun laws, gun bans, warrantless searches of public housing, and the confiscation of firearms in major cities continue to deprive minorities of their right to protect and defend themselves. Violence is increasing. The number of gun-related deaths is increasing yearly. So it should be rather obvious that the gun laws are not working because things are not getting better. They're making more and more laws and it's getting worse. Gun control has not worked. The federal government's own Centers for Disease Control can't show conclusive evidence that reducing guns reduces violence. Yet, these facts are dismissed. Historically, more guns in the hands of decent, law-abiding citizens has had the opposite effect. In 1964, the desegregation of Jonesboro, Louisiana High School was threatened by local authorities with fire hoses. Four armed black men arrived with loaded shotguns. Without firing a shot, the mob dispersed and the authorities retreated. The students entered the school without incident. Those men were members of the Deacons for Defense, an armed citizens militia founded in Jonesboro, Louisiana. The Deacons were everyday citizens who by 1965 had organized into more than 50 chapters throughout the South in self-defense from the Ku Klux Klan. In 1964, down in Louisiana, there were all types of demonstrations going on by Freedom Riders. Many times, the demonstrations would be met by armed white resistance. People were dying and being shot and intimidated because they were unarmed and basically, because they were unarmed, they were also being denied the right to vote. The Deacons protected civil rights workers for CORE, the Congress of Racial Equality, who were registering voters in Louisiana and Mississippi. They patrolled black neighborhoods and protected black churches where CORE was holding voting rights seminars. These were regular, everyday people. They were not some paramilitary group. The thing that made them different is they were veterans from the Korean War, they were veterans from World War II. And so they did have the training and they did have the discipline They came from being veterans. Once the Klansman and the white citizen counselor and the deputy sheriff that was wearing the sheet at night 
learn that these deacons for defense would shoot back, then they were not as readily willing to go and pounce upon them in the wee hours of the morning. Are you going to do something about it? Because now they knew that, well, the right to bear arms is providing constitutional rights for these blacks, irrespective of the fact that we want to take away their civil rights. They're fighting on solid ground. The effectiveness of the deacons in deterring violence was so great that Dr. Martin Luther King and Floyd McKissick of CORE hired the deacons to protect the marchers from Klan aggression in the 1966 March Against Fear. The very effect of armed resistance in the name of civil rights is what really cast a new enthusiasm into the civil rights movement at a critical time. When the right to bear arms is put in the proper perspective historically, then people will see that the African American community having guns to protect themselves, not from crooked cops and police brutality, but from the culture of drugs and gangs because of a war going on due to the narco economy. And so until we address why are these people armed, why are they shooting, we're not going to be able to create an oasis of redevelopment in the inner cities of America. Inner city violence is directly related to the black market for illegal drugs, gangs, and drug dealers' tough wars. Today's war on drugs, like alcohol prohibition in the 1920s, share many similarities. Back then, gangsters and bootleggers took to the streets to protect their territories. Homicide rates skyrocketed at the beginning of prohibition, then took a huge drop after its repeal. Homicide rates again spiked in the early 1970s when President Nixon declared America's war on drugs. More than 35 years later, homicide rates in America's inner cities fluctuate but continue to peak. We've got to stop the demonization of guns. We've got to encourage law-abiding citizens to arm themselves. And then we have to circulate that information throughout the high crime areas. Government published facts speak volumes on the effectiveness of armed citizens. According to the U.S. Bureau of Justice Statistics, 57% of polled felons agree criminals are more worried about meeting an armed victim than they are about running into the police. And according to the U.S. Department of Justice, the probability of serious injury to women during an attack is two and a half times greater when they are unarmed. If women were able to freely carry firearms, there would be less chance of, of somebody looking at them as a victim. There would be less crime committed against women because a criminal would, would have to question, is this woman armed? And according to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, 550 rapes and 1,100 murders are prevented every day just by showing a gun. We've got to tell the other side of the story about the hundreds of thousands of times in America where guns are used to stop violence and to stop a crime from being committed. The police aren't there to protect us. They are there to enforce laws and to arrest criminals once they are criminals, once they have committed a crime. But they're not our personal bodyguards, so I have to do that for myself. No matter how many gun control laws they put into effect, no matter how much they try to restrict it, even if they make it illegal for anybody to own guns, there's going to be a black market. The community does not get safer when the criminals are told there's no guns available on the part of law-abiding citizens. People are going to have access to firearms, and the ones that are going to have them are going to be the criminals. That's like an open season for crime. It's just like drugs are illegal and it's a booming business. History has a habit of repeating itself. Now, as it was back then, politicians and community leaders 
wrongly claim less guns means less violence. Now, as it was back then, politicians and community leaders wrongly misguide the public in believing that the police and not the community can best provide protection. Even though the Supreme Court has publicly stated that state and local governments do not have an obligation to protect citizens from criminal harm. Guns are a convenient target that disingenuous civil rights leaders and politicians hide behind because they don't want to address the real problem, which is why are all the black youth dropping out of high school and getting guns. Gun control advocate Sarah Brady, wife of James Brady, whose name is on the 1993 Brady Bill Violence Protection Act, purchased her own son a high-powered rifle. I think they're misguided and I think it's just, it's a hot issue. We can always get a bunch of politicians, well here's the mayor, here's the alderman, here's the state rep, here's the state, well here's the president of the Senate, here's, they'll always come out to a press conference where they can put on a certain tie and insinuate that they're there to protect the children. It resonates with voters, it's something that's unquestionable in terms of its merit, and it's something that's patently wrong in terms of the gun control issue because gun control does not protect the children. Fact is, a child up to the age of 14 is four times more likely to drown, four times more likely to die in a fire, and 13 times more likely to die in an auto collision than from a firearm accident. And that's a message that has to be driven home. What we've got to do is create a solidarity for gun owners that are across the political spectrum, across the racial spectrum. I think that it's high time that blacks, whites, all Americans of goodwill realize that the sacred right to self-defense is at risk in America during the next four years in an Obama administration with Eric Holder going in as Attorney General. Why? Not because they're bad people, but because their philosophy is such that drying up the availability of guns will create greater safety. So I think that what we're looking for is not to be found with gun control, but can only be found when citizens take it upon themselves to protect themselves and their property. For too long, community leaders, ministers, and politicians have failed to reject the gun control lies. For too long, African Americans have lost control of our neighborhoods. For too long, African Americans have been denied the right to keep and bear arms. For too long, African Americans have been victims of criminals, drug dealers, and dangerous gun control policy. For too long, African Americans have been on the wrong side of the gun. We have to remain vigilant. We have to challenge the Congress when they try to bring about these new gun control laws. And we have to educate the African American community and other communities in America, the racist roots of what gun control is really all about. I believe that productions like this video provide a valuable tool for average everyday Americans to get the message out to their neighbors, to the people in the community, to the people at their church, to the people at their schools, and to the elected officials that set policy in their areas. I think it's essential that this video is downloaded, copied, emailed, and in every children-oriented social service group that has a strong lobby in the U.S. Congress, I think that we should inundate all of these entities with copies of this video and let them respond to the merit of it based on the facts. And I think that then we can create 
a forum nationwide where we can keep the pressure on the public policy centers to ensure that the Second Amendment remains an institution for the United States.